Shang Yang, literally Lord Shang, originated from the small statelet of Wei, located on the southern bank of the Yellow River in the 4th century BCE. Recognising the limiting nature of his home country, Shang Yang emigrated to a neighbouring state, also by the name of Wei, an ascendant power in this era of the warring states. Most importantly, the state of Wei was a trendsetter in its policy of employing skillful foreigners to benefit the country, a practice which would become common throughout China. The Prime Minister of Wei, Gong Xu Chiu, recognised the potential of Shang Yang, and on his deathbed, begged the future King of Wei, Lord Hui, to either appoint Shang Yang as Prime Minister, or have him executed so that he would not serve a foreign country. Lord Hui instead allowed Shang Yang to take up a job offer in the court of Qin, under the newly ascended Lord Xiao, a decision which would change the fate of the entire Chinese world. The state of Qin, once powerful, had fallen into decline due to plots and intrigue in the royal court. Apocryphally, Shang Yang attempted to convince Lord Xiao to follow long-term policy of empowerment, but was only able to attract his ruler's attention when he spoke of the arts of strengthening the state. Soon after arriving in the court, Shang Yang won the favour of Lord Xiao, displacing the more conservative advisers, and was given the position of power he needed to enact an array of sweeping reforms. He ordered the people to be grouped into squads of five to ten, with mutually binding legal responsibility. He also ordered draconian punishments for those who concealed or failed to report crimes, and rewarded those who reported on their neighbours. He set in process punishments for those households who failed to put all efforts towards agriculture, and rewards for those who produced surpluses. Finally, he promoted meritocracy in the military, and promoted military service as a method of social elevation. Shang Yang also proved himself an adept general, diplomat and strategist. He secured an alliance with the neighbouring state of Chu, which allowed the Qin to focus their military power against Shang's one-time employers, the Wei. Shang Yang distinguished himself, leading several military campaigns against the Wei, and sacking their capital. In victory, Shang Yang had secured the Qin's place as new regional hegemon, with Zhou, son of heaven, delivering a special gift of sacrificial meat to recognise the Qin's new position. In return for these services, Shang Yang was given a small strip of land and 15 settlements as an allotment, and this is where the title of Shang, or Lord, is given to him. However, having attained the apex of his fame and power, Shang Yang was destined for a fall. Soon after the death of his employer, Lord Xiao, Shang Yang was accused by his successor, Lord Hui Wen, of treachery. The accusation could have stemmed from the mutilation of Hui Wen's teacher, for a crime the young heir had committed, breaking one of the strict laws that Shang Yang had put into place. It also could have come from the newly ascendant ruler's fear of the capable and powerful minister who potentially threatened his own rule. Whatever the reason, Shang Yang was sentenced to death and torn to pieces by chariots, an ironic reward for the man who laid the foundations of the Qing conquests and the establishment of the first Chinese imperial dynasty. At the end of the 4th century BCE, an anonymous editor compiled a series of texts which had been attributed to Shang Yang into a book, aptly named the Book of Shang Yang. The text is a highly polemical treatise, which attacks the status quo of the Warring States period morality in favour of sweeping reforms. The idea behind these reforms is to adjust a country so as it is best able to deal with changing circumstances, to tack the sails of the ship's state, and make best use of the prevailing winds, while avoiding being dashed on the rocks. The text makes reference to the antique past as a time of hardship and constant conflict, in contrast to the Taoist conceptions of naturalism and harmony in the pre-political world. The source of this turmoil came with the pressures of finite resources and the increasing number of people, a proto-Malthusian hypothesis. The initial ordering of the state, based upon the elevation of worthy individuals to positions of power and the stratification of society, eventually broke down. At this point in the narrative of the text, the worthy individuals needed to institute laws and punishments, which led to the institution of officials, aristocrats, and the position of the ruler. The key point of this narrative appears to be to suggest that merit and worthy moral character are imperfect guardians of the nation, and that instead people should turn to institutions and laws. 
The text's genius comes from its analysis of selfishness. According to the text, it is not through the elimination of selfishness that peace is achieved, but by harnessing it to benefit the state. To quote, The people follow after benefit as water flows downward. It has no preference among the four directions. The people do only what brings them benefit, and the benefit is granted by superiors. However, the desires of the individual and the state were often at cross-purposes. In an age of never-ending war, the text recommended abandoning the ideals of the past and focusing on strengthening the army and preparing for war, the Chinese idiom of the rich state and strong army. To channel this selfishness in human nature to achieve the ends of state, the Book of Shang Yang recommends comprehensive and radical social engineering. This involved the militarization of society and the use of ranks and benefit to those who proved worthy in combat and effective in agriculture, as opposed to the traditional aristocratic families who had dominated the officer class. By incentivizing military and economic prowess through social mobility, the society would naturally generate competent soldiers and farmers, thus turning self-interest into state benefits. The ranks would also be sold off to those with wealth, as a mechanism for siphoning off excessive economic power which could threaten the state. However, by making these ranks non-hereditary, it would mean that the unworthy heirs of rich families could not be assured of their clan's previous glory. The text doesn't merely leave an outline of how this social engineering is to occur. It stipulates the specific gradients of property, wealth and status that are to accompany each gradation of rank, and the specific tokens, usually the severed head of an enemy, which are used to demonstrate one's worthiness for rank. No less important than the benefits and rewards offered for military success are the harsh punishments for cowardice, hoarding, laziness and desertion. It is the combination of the people's dislike of punishments and desire for rewards which Shang Yang hoped would reforge the Qin as a martial people. To implement these measures, a military and civilian bureaucracy would be established which would verify the performance of individuals, reward the deserving, and censure the undeserving. This would allow for the meritocratic social mobility which would grease the ideal military state in the text. The most infamous line in the Book of the Shang Yang is, when the people are weak, the state is strong. The text highlights what it sees as the natural and undesirable conflict between the intrinsic, selfish interests of the people and the broader interests of the state. Although the carrot-and-stick approach previously mentioned sought to re-engine these desires to suit the state, the primary mechanism for controlling the people would be the draconian law code, which would punish those who dared to pursue self-interest at the state's expense. However, in the ideal state, eventually the social engineering above would be internalised by the people, leading to harmony between the desires and the ruler. To achieve this, there is a constant exhortation towards clarity and consistency in the implementation of the Shangyang reforms and law codes. The output of this steady hand would be not only to increase obedience, but also to increase the legibility of taxable products, to steal a phrase from James Scott, and also to protect the people, and more importantly the state, from corrupt officials. Regardless, the text remains intriguing, and gives us insights into one of the great political and social changes that occurred during the Warring States period. However, it should also be noted that the harsh totalitarian tactics of the Shang Yang would be, like the rest of the legalist school, reviled in the later Han Dynasty, and until the rise of Mao would languish as targets of derision for Confucian scholars, denunciation, and ridicule. It is probable that these reforms propelled the Qin state to its position of prominence at the end of the Warring States period, although how close they came to the ideal will forever be a mystery. It saw the agricultural productiveness of the state and the power of its military as the two key outputs of governance and sought to use a system of harsh punishments and tangible rewards to re-engineer society to achieve these objectives. The Shang Yang represented one of the first apologetics of unabashed state power in ancient China, a formative document in the legalist tradition.